The 4th of July sets up a perfect day for Major League Baseball and has given many memorable moments throughout the years, but one that stands out took place in 1985 between the Mets and the Braves, a game that started on the 4th and finished well into the 5th and had many insane moments throughout. So let's look at that 4th of July game that refused to end. Totally sports ask. Major League. Going into this 4th of July game, both of these franchises were going in different directions. The Mets were six games over 500 at 41 and 35, and third in the NL East, while the Braves were eight games under 500 and second to last in the NL West, the division where they belong. And the Braves were starting a rebuild after Eddie Haas became manager, after Joe Torre, who managed the Braves from 82 to 84. And Haas wouldn't last much longer after this game, and neither would Bobby Wine. The Mets, on the other hand, had reason to be excited. Two years after Daryl Strawberry won Rookie of the Year, Dwight Gooden won the following year and was having one of the best seasons ever for a pitcher. And these two were on their way to the All-Star Game, along with Ron Darling, with Strawberry hitting fifth in the lineup behind the Braves' only All-Star and Dale Murphy. But before they got there, they of course had to play a few more games, including this one on the 4th of July at Fulton County Stadium. Over 44,000 tickets were sold for this game, and those who came had no idea what they were getting into. And what many wanted to get into was the post-game fireworks. And in this game, the Mets would have their second-year ace on the mound in Dwight Gooden, and the Braves would also have their ace in Rick Mahler. But before they could take the mound for the scheduled 7.30 start, they were hit by a 90-minute rain delay, delaying the start and the fireworks. And when things got underway, both teams started early. The Mets would string off three straight two-out hits to go up 1-0. And in the bottom half, Claudel Washington would lead things off with a triple, and a ground out would bring him in to tie the game. And despite walking through in the first inning, that would be all that Gooden gave up. Both went quiet in the second, and in the top of the third, Mahler would do the same as Gooden by walking through with two outs and not giving up any runs. Gooden would strike out Dale Murphy, then give up a single to Bob Horner, and that would be it for him. Not because of an injury or he didn't have it, but because the rain began falling once again, causing an additional 40-minute delay. After the delay, Mets manager David Johnson decided not to send the 20-year-old Dwight Gooden back to the mound, and after he was not allowed to make a double switch, the Mets played the game under protest. And when things got underway again, Gooden would end up with an additional earned run after Roger McDowell gave up two runs. And despite the second delay, Rick Mahler was sent back out, and that ended up being a bad decision when he gave up two hits and was taken out. And the Mets proceeded to score four runs off Terry Dedman to go up 5-3. Terry Leach would relieve McDowell, and he pitched good, giving up just one over four. And when he came out, the Mets were leading 7-4 after Keith Hernandez's solo home run to lead off the eighth. And this should have given him the cycle, but an incorrect call on what should have been a single in the sixth prevented that from happening at that point. Jesse Orozco, the man with the most pitching appearances in MLB history, made one of his 1,252 appearances after Leach, and it didn't go so well. After he gave up a hit and walked three, the Mets were up two as he came out of the game with the bases loaded and two outs. Doug Sis came into the game, and at the plate was the Braves' lone all-star and someone who won MVP in 82 and 83 and probably should be in the Hall of Fame in Dale Murphy. And he would hit a double in the gap. That would clear the bases and give the Braves a lead. Bob Horner would line out, but the Braves fans who stuck around after both delays were going to watch the Braves win and finally see those fireworks. And they had reason to be confident with the Braves' biggest offseason pickup coming into the game and Bruce Suter, someone who led the league in saves five times and will be the first Hall of Fame pitcher who never started a game. But that night, and for really all of 1985, he did not have it, as after striking out Ray Knight, he would give up three straight singles, which tied the game. Suter would get the next two, and after the Braves couldn't score in the bottom half, things were of course going to extras, and the people who were there just for the fireworks had a measurable disappointment. But the rest were willing to stay all night, and well, they got what they wanted. Doug Sisk and Terry Forster would both pitch great to the 12th, giving a few hits and ending innings with double plays, including in the 12th, where Keith Hernandez got a single, which officially gave him the 206th cycle in Major League history, though he really should have already had it. And after he completed the feed in the 12th, Forster remained in the game. He got the first two, then Ray Knight got a two-out single. Then Howard Johnson came up. He pinch hit for Rafael Santan in the ninth and got the tying rally started. And here, he had a go-ahead two-run home run to put the Mets up 10-8 and give them a 92% chance to win this game. And into the game for the Mets came Tom Gorman, who was looking to give the Mets the win. He gave up a leadoff single to Rafael Ramirez, but struck out the next two to bring up Terry Harper, who was making his seventh trip to the plate and just like Howard Johnson, he would hit a two-out, two-run home run to tie the game, dropping the Mets' win probability from 96% to 47%. And after a pop-out, things would continue for all who clearly didn't have to work the next day. The Mets rallied in the 14th, 
but could not score, and just like Forster and Sisk had done, Gene Garner and Tom Gorman were putting up zeros, giving up few hits, and getting out of jams. Things went to the 17th well past midnight, and into the game came Rick Camp, and he would give up a single to Gary Carter, and proceeded to strike out Daryl Strawberry, who would argue the calls, and proceeded to be thrown out of the game, along with manager David Johnson. So things went to the 18th, still tied at 10, with the Mets' best hitter and their manager gone, and in the top of the 18th, Howard Johnson would hit a single, and Rick Camp would make a costly error that put runners on first and third with no one out. And the advancement was huge when Lenny Dykstra would hit a go-ahead sack fly to make things 11 to 10, which would be the score as things went to the bottom half. Gorman was still on the mound and got Gerald Perry and Terry Harbour to ground out, and after playing 17.2 innings, naturally teams had to make substitutions, but no anticipations that things would last this long. So the Braves are forced to send Rick Camp up to the plate after his two innings of work. Being a pitcher, he of course got very few at-bats in his career, but even when he did, he didn't do so great. He went into this at-bat with a lifetime batting average of .060, going 10 for 167, with 83 strikeouts. So essentially, the game was over, and it felt like the Braves could go back to the clubhouse after he went down 0-2. But then, one of the most unexpected moments in baseball history happened when Rick Camp hit a home run over the left field wall. And at that point, all you could do was laugh, and you can see the disbelief in the faces of the Mets. Ray Knight flung his arms in the air after it went by him at third, Danny Heap threw his arms up in disbelief, and Howard Johnson and Lenny Dykstra dropped to a knee in disbelief, as the fans who were still there figured they were going to be there for the rest of their lives. Tom Gorman felt worse than anyone. He would say, it's not like pitchers don't hit home runs, but in that situation, with two strikes and no balls, and you give the guy a pitch he can hit out, it's embarrassing. And Camp in a sense would agree, as he called his home run pure luck, saying if you had to rely on me to hit home run, then you're in bad shape. Regardless of it all, the game that refused to end went to the 19th, tied at 11. And after hitting the game-tying home run, Camp had to go back on the mound, and the Mets would give it right back to him. After a sack bun and an intentional walk, there were two men on, and up came Ray Knight who had left the bases loaded three times to that point. But this time, he came through, hitting a double that put the Mets up 12 to 11. And the Mets proceeded to score four more runs to go up 16 to 11 as things went to the bottom half. And into the game had to come the other Mets all-star pitcher and Ron Darling. And there was something lurking in the air after Cladell Washington reached out an error. And after getting the second out, Darling walked two straight to load the bases, and Terry Harper would again extend the game with a single that scored two to make it 16-13. And wouldn't you know it, up to the plate once again came Rick Camp, with a chance to tie the game again. And once again, he had two strikes on him. And this time, they did not mess around with a hitter like Rick Camp, as he would strike out to finally end the game in the 19th inning at 3.14 a.m., six hours and ten minutes after the game started and actually about eight hours after it was supposed to start. The Mets celebrated, and the Braves secretly did too, as they could get some rest before playing each other again in a few hours. Though this was Daryl Strawberry's normal bedtime anyway. But fans left that night, probably unfit to drive, knowing they saw history in a game where there were 29 runs, 46 hits, 22 walks, 37 runners left on base, 5 errors, 2 ejections, a player hitting for the cycle, and a f***ing relief pitcher hitting a game-tying home run in the 18th inning. What at the time was the latest a game had ever finished, until the second game of a doubleheader in 1993 between the Padres and Phillies that ended at 4.40 a.m. In a game that also had rain delays, and actually also a relief pitcher hitting a walk-off, with Mitch Williams getting one of his three career hits off Trevor Hoffman in the bottom of the ninth. The second most famous walk-off he was involved in that year. And as a reward for those who stayed for this entire 19-inning affair, even though it was 4 in the morning, the Braves decided to shoot off those fireworks, because promises are not meant to be broken. And because of what time it was, and people having no idea that they were going to shoot fireworks off, 911 operators in the area received many calls from concerned residents, with some actually saying they were concerned that a nuclear war had broken out with the Soviet Union. Really a perfect ending to a bizarre night. And after that game, the Mets would go on to win 98 games, but finish second in the NL East to the Cardinals, which wasn't enough for a playoff spot in this time. But Dwight Gooden would have one of the greatest seasons ever, throwing 276.2 innings with a 1.53 ERA, the lowest since 1917. In a year he had a 13.3 war and was arguably robbed of the MVP. And after this year, the Mets would have their dream season, 
winning 108 games and going on to beat the Red Sox in the World Series in seven games after the miraculous comeback in Game 6. And as for the Braves, they would finish the season 30 games under 500. And as already mentioned, they would finish the season with a new manager and a new GM as one of their former managers, Bobby Cox, became GM at the end of 1985. Allen helped the Braves get the right pieces as he became manager once again in 1990 and stayed there for 20 years, helping the Braves win 14 trade division titles, five pennants, and a World Series. Very far from where they were in 1985 at 2.30 in the morning with Rick Camp hitting a game-tying home run in the 18th inning on the 5th of July in a moment that overshadowed the rest of the game as most probably don't even realize that the Braves ended up losing this game and hopefully in the future, MLB takes more advantage of the 4th of July by providing marquee matchups on this day, just like the NBA does on Christmas. And you can watch my video about one of the most important players in the Braves' success in the 90s and Greg Maddox and his four consecutive Cy Young seasons.